My debut fight was in 1995, about 26 years ago. Man, it was such a rush, so much jitter, so much nerve, so much anxiety. I'm going to talk about it, so check it out. What's up, everybody, and welcome to the Yamato Damashi podcast. My name is James, and of course, I'm joined by Mr. Ensign Inoue. Today, we're going to talk about how Ensign actually got into his first debut fight. So if you remember from the last time, we were discussed a bit how Ensign got, you know, the idea, the bit of the, the urge to go into training. We talked about uh, his um, relationship a little bit with the Gracies and seeing Hickson fight live. But I guess what I think a lot of fans are curious to know, Ensign, is how you actually came to sort of you know, fight, you, you moved to Japan. How did you get involved in actually finding a gym? Well, after, after watching the Hickson fight, I, I had this little quest inside of me to get in the ring once, whether it was an amateur ring or whatever. So, of course, uh, to get in the ring, you need to have association to fight for. And for me, I was just a, pretty much totally a jiu-jitsu fighter. So striking tackles weren't really in my repertoire. So I had to really look around and find... I wasn't going to be dumb and I wasn't going to go say, okay, let me try to get into K1 and when I'm not even qualified for it. One, if I did get in, I get my ass kicked and it'd be really, really like useless, loose, useless experience. So what I did was I looked around, I went to the video stores. I've I rented some tapes, looked at all the different types of associations. You know, I looked at even some like pro wrestling ones that are totally fake. And then you look at ones that totally have no ground involved, just standing. So, you know, some of the ones that really uh, I narrowed it down to was uh, Pancras, Rings, UWF, and Shuto. So what I did first was the you know, the, the biggest ones was uh, Pancras is actually the most popular at the time. So I called the Pancras gym, and they told me that there's a new boy test that I have to wait for. But in the meantime, send me a resume, and we need two pictures of you um, waist up and then full body. So I actually did that. I mean, I, I would like, I would love to find uh, if the pancreas still has that on file. I would love to see that and you know make a picture and copy it. But so I sent that in. As I'm waiting, the next big association was Rings. Um, so I figured, okay, Rings might be good. They they have some ground. They have rope escapes, but there's ground involved enough that I could probably display my ground. So I called Rings. They had the same thing. They said, send them a resume. And then you wait for us to contact you with the new boy test. That's okay. Did that. Then I called UWF. I, you know, had Sakuraba, Kanehara. Those guys are in UWF. And, I, you know, UWF was hard because when I looked at it, I half the time I was like, that's fucking fixed. And then half the time, like, holy shit, that can't be fixed. So I was kind of confused, but I figured I'd as well give it a try. So I called them. And a lady answered the phone. And she told me, she started asking me, like, weird questions. Like, how old are, how old are you? Like, uh, why does that matter? I'm this old. How tall are you and how heavy are you? I'm like, what the hell? So I'm like, okay. My age was a little over than what they wanted. So I was like, oh, this is weird. So I was like, okay, maybe I'll wait for pancreas and uh, rings for the new boy test. And in the meantime, I called Shuto. And when I called Shuto, uh, some uh, office guy answered the phone. They passed me to Sayama, the founder of Shuto himself. And then he, he, I told him I did a little jujitsu, and I'd like to get in the ring, amateur ring, whatever. And if uh, you know, if you want to see me, I can. I they had a they're a light heavyweight champion, Kawaguchi, was uh, actually fought in the volley two though ninety four that Hickson fought, and he lost in the earlier round, so he didn't meet Hickson. But I said, you know, I can be a sparring partner for him, you know, just to show my ability. And then you know, it was surprising to me because I was expecting to give get that usual routine like oh wait for the test day and all this stuff but he pretty much told me come down when you can i'm like whoa so i think it was maybe like a two days later about it was soon i jumped on the bullet train went straight down there and walked into the walked into the shuto gym and that's you know that's how everything started so uh satoru sayama was famous initially for being a, a famous pro wrestler in Japan, uh, the initial, the original Tiger Mask. Um, mm -hmm. But he later obviously went on to sort of found uh, Shuto. Um, 
what was the experience like uh, working with Sayama and, and, and the gym itself? Well, it was interesting because, you know, pro wrestlers, they, they, they have uh, their, they actually, you know, they do like real moves and real kicks and real submissions. So I guess Sayama did a lot of studying with um, Carl Gotch, catch wrestling. So he did a lot of uh, submission wrestling type of stuff just stuff enough that they can do in the in the ring so he did you know of course they, they start off and they show striking so he actually learned striking so he he was it was surprising because when he, he actually knew how to strike so when i went into um his gym he had me spar with somebody a little guy and i, I sparred with him and then i dominated him i just thought he was just some little japanese kid and after i sparred him and dominated him Sayama sat up and looked at the kid and goes, man, we can use this guy. And I, and he said, he said, you want to fight? I said, yeah, I want to fight. And I'm thinking amateur ring, you know, get into a little amateur ring just to get that experience of man to man combat. And he goes, okay, three months later, you do your pro debut. I'm like, whoa, pro debut. No. <laughs> and he convinced me, he convinced me, he said, don't worry about it. You'll be ready. I'll get you ready. So I actually got so serious that I, I used to be a racquetball player at the time. I just cold turkey cut playing racquetball, moved down to the gym, slept in the private rooms they have there, and trained every day with Sayama. And later on, I, I started seeing, you know, you know, in the office, like, shit, that kid that I sparred with was in a lot of magazines. And turns out he was Nakai Yuki, now the head of jiu-jitsu in uh, Japan. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, we'll, we'll cover a bit about um, some of the training leading up to uh, Valley Tudo 95 with Nakai Yuki in another episode, but I guess um, so. When you when you were working with Sayama, obviously, I guess you what you brought to the gym was a real great background in jujitsu. Um, was there a lot of different styles at the gym that you know different people? Was it quite a good 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 atmosphere, good vibe for learning? It was a good vibe. It was uh, they had good standing and good tackles. Mm. But as far as the ground, they understood submissions. But uh, what they didn't understand, which is really amazing, is that you know, they always have that same position before submission because if you don't have the right position, you won't get this, you won't be able to execute a submission. So they, the funny thing is they didn't even think position was important and they were just going through this lock flow and, you know, a lot of stuff, you know, a lot of those catch wrestling stuff, which is pretty good, but without position, it's not that effective. So Sayama actually was a real genius in um, deciphering mar martial arts and, you know, I mean, he's the founder of Shuto. He has that much innovation in his head that he can actually do that. So he started plugging me on the ground. And what happened was, the you know, in, in his gym, uh, like five or six o'clock in the evening, it started when all the members and pro fighters come in. So the daytime, there was nobody. It was empty. It was just an empty gym. And that's the time, that's about the same time frame that I went down to spar with um, Nakai the first time. So it was just me and him in the gym. And in the daytimes, me and Simon would go in the ring. I mean, go in the gym. He would show me tackles and some striking. And I would, in, in turn, I would show him a lot of the ground. Like, this is what – he he had a lot of questions. Like, okay, why is the mount so good? You know, how do you get the mount? Why can't people just throw you off the mount? Well, how can you keep the mount? You know, all that kind of stuff. It was kind of interesting, you know, because he was plugging me. And then he told me that I'm like the – this is what he told me is I'm I'm the secret weapon for Shuto because Shuto didn't have any heavyweights. So he said, um, I saw him going into magazines and on TV explaining the, the ground that I was teaching him. And he was explaining it like he kind of figured it out or, or this is what I know about Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. You know, he was kind of teaching what I taught him. And I, I, you know, I'm not an ego monster. So I, I wasn't like, oh, fuck, well, how come I'm not getting credit? I was cool with it. I understood that Simon was giving me a chance that I wanted to get in the ring. So, hey, um, big deal. I didn't care. He said, yeah, you're a secret weapon, so I won't be saying anything about you. Don't worry. Don't get offended. I said, no, no, no problem. No problem. So he kind of used it as his. He he figured it out. And the thing about that is real funny is after I was I made my debut and I was no longer a secret weapon, he never once did say that, oh, you know, that round that I was showing you guys, Ensign actually showed me that. So <laughs> it's kind of funny. But, yeah, you know, for me, it's not even an issue. I talk about it now because it doesn't even matter anymore. 
Mm-hmm. But yeah, when that happened, it was kind of I kind of chuckled in the back of my head and just let it go. Yeah, yeah. You know what? You know what's really interesting that I want to point out is I when I I was hanging out with Siamo so much we would go dinner together like that. And there was one time we went to dinner and I was I was in freaking awe because when we're crossing the street to go to the Yakiniku restaurant. There was these guys in this car that drove by and just said, oh, my God, Sayama, do your best. We're cheering for you. And I was like, I looked at him, he goes, oh, who's that? I told him, he goes, I don't know, some fans. I'm like, what are you talking about? Some people that don't know you are screaming your name? He goes, Ensign, train hard. It's going to happen to you. And I, I was pretty much like, that's, that's like totally off the wall. That will never happen to me. But it's kind of cool that he thinks that. Mm-hmm. But. Wow, that was wild, but you know, yeah. it's amazing. It happens to me very, very often in today, today's world, you know, for me. But I remember that first time when that happened, I was like, holy shit, that is, that's got to be crazy. People that you don't even know personally know you and talk about you and cheer about you. You know, it's, it was baffling for me. And, yeah. you know, being in this position now, it's pretty unbelievable to think back in those days. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. So that was the first time you had that sort of, uh, you saw that, I guess, suppose celebrity reaction from someone that you were yeah, with, right? Yeah, it was, it was somebody that I personally knew. I was like, whoa, what the, whoa, who the hell was that? You know? <laughs> For real. That's great. So so let's just uh, fast forward a little bit. So in terms of like when the, the just before the fight was going to happen, sort of going into the fight, what was your feelings like? Because obviously in the last episode, you talked about really putting yourself in really uh, – the sort of most highest anxiety position that you could be in and that you wanted to really sort of test yourself, challenge yourself as a man and, and see what you could do. So what was your thoughts going into the fight leading up to it? Well, for me, the opponent that I fought wasn't, um, he was, I think it was his MMA debut too, but it, always, it didn't matter who the opponent was. For me, it was about getting in the ring. And just, you know, like I talked about before in the past, you know, the, the sport, the objective of the sport, you got all these other sports that have different objectives. Put a ball through a hoop, run the ball past this line. But fighting, man, you got to think about it. Objective is to punch your opponent in the head. Every other sport in the world, you get disqualified and kicked out of the sport for. But that's the objective of MMA. Either punch him in the head that he gets he's he's rendered unconscious, or you you know you hyperextend his limb so bad that you break it, or you extend the ligament, you rip the ligaments, or you choke him out and give him, you, you don't give him enough oxygen, he goes to sleep unconscious. So, you know, with that, you know, that whole objective in that sport, I mean, for me, it didn't matter who I fought because it was my debut, man. I was like, didn't know. I really didn't know what to expect because I'd never been in that. I've been in a lot of street fights, but as you know, street fights, you don't have months to prepare for it. You don't have months to be nervous for it. You don't have... You know, this guy that knows that he's going to fight you months prior and practicing specifically for you. And when you go in the ring, you're not angry. When you go in the street fight, someone does something to piss you off in that journal and just boom, you fight. Mm -hmm. But in the ring, man, you're not mad. This guy didn't do anything against you. He knows about you. You know about him. You know, everyone's watching. And the shitty thing about it is it's going to be on video. And if you get your ass kicked, it's going to be documented for the rest of your life. You know, so so yeah. for me, I just I really didn't have any idea what it was going to be like. You know, I was thinking about every time I would lay down at night before the fights and start thinking about the fight, I couldn't sleep. So you know, it was like I didn't know what to expect. I was really like wondering and guessing, and you know, fight day came, the jitter started building up. I'm thinking, I keep repeating to myself, "You trained, you're ready, you're ready, you're ready, you're ready." You're ready. And Sayama kept telling me that too. So he gave a lot of assurance. And, you know, when I got into ring, I remember the first thing when I got into ring, I, you know, at the gym that I trained at, there had a ring. But for some reason, this ring just felt so different, man. And then, you know, when I'm standing there, it's like I almost felt like that my, my, hat, my waist down wasn't me. It felt really light, really weird. Like, fuck, I can't really... I can't, don't get that right movement. It, it felt super weird. I mean, in the in the fight, when you watch the fight, you can't tell that. But mm. I felt really insecure and just wondering how, what, what's going to happen. 
Is it, how did it feel, I suppose, when, you know, you, you, you make your ring entrance, suddenly there's all these fans watching as well? Because it was on a pretty sizable stage. It wasn't like, you know, uh, perhaps some of like the regional MMA scenes that you see these days where, you know, not that, you know, not that yeah, many people it was there. Pretty at all. Famous arena. Mm. So it's in the Korakuen Hall, which is a pretty yeah. big, famous arena, famous for fighting. So, yeah, that, you know, with all, and this, this is a, it was a pretty full house. And I was a second fight of the night, right? So you know, it was kind of it was kind of nice not to have to sit in the back and listen to all the fights happening, seeing guys get knocked out, and just you know, building that anxiety. So so pretty much when we got to the arena, we had the doctor's check. We you know we got ready, warmed up. Like you're a second fight of the night, gotta get ready. Yeah. And it, it happened fast, so it was good, man. But like I said, to continue, man, the you know, she's the. Even when I, I remember coming in, and my whole objective was to get him to the ground. So right there, I'm it's all going through my head. Okay, how am I going to do this? Okay, I'm going to throw the jabs that Simon taught me. Throw the jabs, trying to get close, waiting for that timing. And I was waiting, waiting. You know, I remember Simon teaching me that when the guy commits to a strike is when you should change levels and take the tackle. And I was waiting, jabbing, and this guy would circle me, circle me, and I was saying, "Oh my God!" You know, it's funny because you watch the fight and you think the fighter is all confident and secure. But literally, I was in there thinking, damn, is he going to tackle me? When's the timing? What, what do I do? What do I do? And as I'm thinking that, he commits on a, a bigger strike. And instinctively, because I trained it so much, I got in, got the clinch, and took him down. And right there, from there, once I took him down and I, I established a mount, um, I knew already by sparring so much, um, so many hours on the mat with people who know their ground i knew already that this guy didn't know the ground he didn't the, his movement his he wasn't trying to regain guard he wasn't trying to reverse me from the mount he was down there and he was like a fish out of water it must be pretty satisfying right when, <laughs> when you're in your debut fight and suddenly you really yeah. you know you realize that actually you've got the pair of him um immediately yeah, so when you're in that world about that was that there was like this Real anxiety drop, like oh, who I can't. No, I wasn't totally relaxed yet, but it st- was like the, the the jitters, the the anxiety really subsided. And I'm like, okay, fuck, we're, we're in my turf, and I I was really confident on the ground because I was one of the better, one of uh, Helson's better students. Mm-hmm. So I was really confident on the ground. When it got to the ground, I was like, okay, we I never train mount punches. You know, yeah. I always had that, you know punching, and you thought it was instinctive. You don't need to train to punch. So I got the mount, I, you know, and it was really awesome was that he didn't threaten escaping the mount at all. So my whole 100% of my concentration went into my striking. So I remember, man, okay, I'm going to finish this now. And I remember thinking that I don't want to choke him out. I want to beat him. I want to break him. I want to break his will. So I figured, you know, you choke him out, they're, they're, they're not going to get air. They get scared. They're going to tap out because they oh, I couldn't breathe. But when you're... You can't breathe and you tap out to a whole different instance where you're looking at someone sitting on you and he's trying to hurt you with punches to your face. That's a whole different terror. So I wanted to establish that terror on him to break his heart, break his will. So I remember that. I remember going on. I didn't even think of armbar. I didn't even think of any chokes. I just kept pummeling down. And um, because I didn't train mount punches, you know, big important thing about punches is whenever you punch, it's important that Behind your fist, there's the elbow. So if I'm punching in this direction, the elbow has to be right behind the punch. But I was punching like, like that, like like almost like a like a like a racquetball swing. I was punching. It was really weird. You watch the videos. Like I'm like I'm like doom, doom. It's like a little. There's nothing behind my behind my fist is the other side of my fist. I had no elbow behind it. So it was like a little bit little slaps, slaps, slaps. But you know, I guess you know. I remember doing that, hitting him, hitting him to. I thought I, I imaged that I was hitting him hard. I le- later on, when I saw the video, I was like, "Holy shit, that looks like bitch slaps!" <laughs> and and then you know, I remember Mount. Okay, Mount fights over. I'm gonna just pummel him now. I remember hitting him, hitting him, hitting him. And I remember to, going to a point like, "Holy shit, he's still here!" And now I'm starting to get a little tired Mount punching him. When people watch the fight, they they don't see that, but I actually was getting a little tired. I was getting a little winded punching. And it's really weird how throughout my whole career is when you're hitting the guy, you have this instinct to kill. 
But the weird thing is, I don't know why it is, but when I heard him screaming, ah! when I was punching, he was like, ah! Ah! I heard him scream. I thought, oh, this is the end. For some reason, when you see your prey starting to break, this it brought a different ex- anger to me. It brought a different aggression. Because, you know, you're there. I'm ready to, I want to hurt him. I'm, and then, But when you see him starting to break, that brought that like, ah! Like you really want to hurt him. And wow. it was, the interesting thing for me was that if you watch the tape of the video is I'm hitting him and he starts screaming. If you listen really good, you can hear him going, ah! Ah, like that. <laughs> and then when the ref stops in, you could see my whole body language. I was still like tense, like almost like he's still alive, you know. And looking at him like, fuck, are you gonna get out? What are you gonna do? You know, it was over. But I was still for me, I don't know, it was it was really weird because I couldn't it wasn't a game for me, it wasn't a sport. For me, it was about fighting for my life, you know, either him or I. And I guess for me, in my head, it was he's still alive. And I was like, is he still going to threaten me? And I, I had in the back of my head, no, this is a sport. This ref just stopped you. But yeah, he's still alive. I didn't finish my job. <sighs> you know, he had that tension. And it was real interesting to me because I thought that, you know, when you after you win the fight, you'd be like, yeah, go hug your corner man like that. But for, for me, there was no happiness. It was just, ugh. You try to why'd you try to kill me? Why do you try to hurt me? And then there's a then there's a little adjusting feeling like oh fuck, I'm alive. Yes, I fucking that fucker tried to hurt me. It's still in that that I want to hurt you mode, man. And yeah. it, it for me, it took about probably a minute or two for me to actually, you know, release that against the guy and be like, Whoo, yes, I want. You know, it was it was a re, you know, not just the ring experience, not just you know. The, the feeling of how the ring felt and how it felt to be man to man combat, that that aggression and that that you know that how do you say it? that ferocity that it brought out in me, mm-hmm. it was it was something that I really didn't experience as much you know because when you're in a street fight everything is going wild so you don't read your your for your anger and your attention isn't that prominent in your head because everything is chaos. People are trying to stop you, women screaming, guys throwing shit. Blah, blah, blah. So you don't realize until you get away in your car, you're like you're breathing out, like, oh fuck, that was crazy. But because it's a ring and there's no one else jumping in to stop you, the ref calmly just jumps in between you and stops you. It's so quiet, it's so serene, and you can feel every bit of that ferocity and that anger and that fire you feel. And it was really distinct for me. And for me, it was that was a real big thing for me. Like, holy shit, that was crazy. And in a way, it was like a real crazy adrenaline rush, man. It was like, ooh, you almost you don't you you don't like that anxiety, but for some reason, that 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 alpha ness that you just killed something was just so intriguing. So uh, once the adrenaline rush had sort of ended, you sort of started to head backstage what what was the the feelings like there just from not just from yourself but maybe from like sayama and the other guys you were training with what what was the the general sort of feeling backstage um egan i always say this this is real interesting i always say this that if you want to see the concern and the insecurity that a fighter or corner man had about the fight you can watch their reaction so if i'm in there like you've watched my ufc 13 fight after i win i'm just pumping my fist I was really confident I was going to win. Mm. But then you see, like, uh, some fighters, they win, they start crying. That shows how much insecurity and, and worry they had about whether they're going to win. Some people look at it and say, oh, he's just super happy he won. But being super happy he won encompasses the fact that there was that insecurity, that doubt that, shit, maybe I can't win. So so if you watch that fight, you know, it's like I was pretty, uh, I was pretty confident. I felt good. So when I was going to the back, I was more relieved that it was over. I got my experience. I'm done. And I remember my brother, he seemed pretty confident. And he was a little bit excited when I won. But I could tell he was a little worried, but not as much. And then you got guys like Sayama that came in the back right away. I mean, he was excited. And you know the funny thing is all he could talk about is who I'm going to fight next. I'm like, whoa. And I'm thinking to myself, did I voice it? properly to him to let him know that this is just one fight and then when i thought i really didn't tell him that 
I didn't say, hey, Samo, this is just for one fight, man. And, man, it was just hard. At that time, I said, I'll talk to him later, but he was just going off and, man, there's a volley to do. I wanted you to fight in the tournament and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, holy shit. That's crazy. And, you know, Korakuen holds about 1,800 people. Yeah. The, the volley to do Japan was in the, the Nihon Budoka. Uh, Udo, Nihon Budoka. And that shit holds 50,000. Yeah. So, oh, you know, and he mentioned that. I was like, well, one fight. What the hell? <laughs> and then, <laughs> and then you know, with all excitement, I just let that go. And, you know, my, my, my father flew up for all my fights. He came in the back and congratulated me. And not a mark of my face. And I just felt, wow, that was crazy. But, uh, you know, it's funny because no matter how happy I was or relieved I was that I won, the biggest thing that bothered me in the back of my head was shit. It's not that easy to finish someone on the mount, man. I, I was, I was really um, not disappointed, but more just you know, like wow, it was a what a, was an eye opener for me that mount isn't that dominant of a position. You still got to work to finish someone. Yeah, it's interesting that I really stuck with you actually. That like of all you know the feelings of the fight, the one that stuck with you is actually that hey, mount wasn't as uh, easy as you thought it would be, but. Yeah, yeah. Like you know, the, everything else was, you know, the the tackle went smooth. Everything went good. Got the grunt. Got the, and I just that was just something that I guess um, you know training with house and them, getting the mount was pretty much the end of the fight. You know, mm -hmm. and then you got you watch the Gracie Jiu Jitsu in action video, you know, and it's like every time the Gracies got the mount, you well, know, I need to also mention that they're freaking professional. Pros really good, the best in the world at their what they can do. Mm -hmm. So you're looking at them and get the mount. They pretty much finish everyone in mount punches. So I'm thinking in my head is get the mount is over. So that was a big mm -hmm. eye opener for me. It's like holy shit, the Gracies get the mount and they they make it over. But I'm not a Gracie. I'm I'm like one tenth of a Gracie. I can't be as good as the Gracie. What the fuck? You know, it's kind of an eye opener. I thought shit, mount finish. All right, I got the mount. Yes, I'm gonna finish this fucker. <laughs> and then it's like, holy shit, he's still there. I'm getting tired. What the hell? <laughs> All right, great. Well, that was really interesting to hear sort of how the, the debut came about and uh, and actually like your feelings like going through the fight itself. Um, but what we'll do is we'll, we're going to wrap this episode up and on the next one, we're going to talk through uh, a big fight in your career and a big step up fighting uh, Mr. Rene Rosé uh or ruse uh and uh yeah we, we'll talk about that next time and uh in the meantime i hope everyone continues to like and subscribe and uh enjoys these videos